Yeah, so officially I'll get going. Thank you very much for those people to make the time available to come to this uh, webinar on the proposed methamphetamine stamp regulations. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, very um, experienced gentlemen to help me today as panelists. We've got Gavin Bush, who's chairperson of the MTIANZ. Maybe you'd like to tell me, uh, Gavin, as a test, what does that stand for? Okay, well, uh, the Beth Testing Industry Association has been upgraded. We now call ourselves the New Zealand Association for Contaminant-Free Properties. We had to broaden our scope a little bit, David. Uh, so now we include the meth testers, the meth decontaminating companies. Um, we've also got asbestos surveyors and people doing healthy homes things as well. So broadened our scope. And uh, yeah, so basically we, we do, as you've set up there, basically to try and promote professionalism in the industry and to lobby and to pass information, pretty much like the RPMA does, I think, same sort of um, function, yeah. Okay, and yeah, thanks for making the time available and uh, especially since you're from Hawke's Bay. Yeah. And <laughs> Miles, uh, Stratford, most people will know Miles. Or Morning, everybody. Yeah, um, Miles is Director of Meth Solutions and uh, has been very much involved in trying to keep meth out of houses. So welcome, Miles. Thank you, David. Um, Appreciate the opportunity uh, to be involved. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, so, and, oh, sorry, I should introduce myself if people don't know. I'm David Pierce. Um, I'm the chairperson of the Residential Property Managers Association. Um, so yeah, let's, let's start working our way through. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to start building some a basis for the webinar by doing some background, um, just to let you know that when it comes to methamphetamine and residential properties, uh, especially rentals, um, there is the New Zealand meth standard that was, I don't know, guys, when was that first brought into play? Years ago. Started in 2016, was published in 2017. Yeah, that's the new one, but... Um, oh, the guidelines, 2010. Oh, yeah. 2010, yeah. So the guidelines were brought in and they were reviewed at 2017. And uh, what was involved was local authorities, insurance, property interest. Uh, at that time, we were called the Independent Property Managers Association, and we were certainly involved with that. Um, and, yeah, so that was... They met and decided that the actual to review the New Zealand meth standard and they raised it from 0 0.5 micrograms to 1.5. Um, I think at the time there were some politicians who were hoping it might've been higher than that. But again, I think the attitude was, is that when it comes to people's health, it's better to be uh, safe than, you know, in it. Yeah, just, just on that, David, because uh, I was on the standards committee, uh, the, the the number in there, whilst it was set by the committee, was done on the basis of advice from ESR, uh, and ESR were commissioned to do some work by uh, Ministry of Health. ESR, because of the politics of meth contamination in houses and what you just mentioned about what the political desire was, uh, commissioned overseas scientists to do the work because they didn't feel there was anybody of sufficient competence or independence in New Zealand uh, to do that work. So that's how we ended up with a number of 1.5 uh, in the New Zealand standard. And the standard setting process is, is specifically set up to be independent of politics, uh, which is very different from everything else you're going to talk about now. And 1.5 miles at that time was a fairly high number, wasn't it? I remember, you know, 0.5 being the number before that. So the acceptable level was stretched a little bit at that time, I remember. For sure. Mm. Okay. And then we had the Gluckman report, which came out just a year later um, from the Chief Science Officer. Um, and, yeah, and that came out and said that um, they thought that levels of 15 micrograms did not pose any risk to residents of, of methamphetamine contaminated homes. But to be fair to Gluckman, I suppose, in the conclusions I've got there, it's really clear. He says, we note, however, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence of an effect. There is clear need for research and a coordinated interagency effort to build up a robust data set. Now, guys, do you know if there's any been any uh, clear interagency effort or coordinated or more research been done since then? I think there's a clear interagency effort to persuade people that the new de facto standard is 15, uh, but no work whatsoever 
when it comes to doing uh, research has been done by uh, the government. There has been some limited overseas research that's been done and ESR have taken a look at that and said it's suggestive of a causal relationship, but no actual real world uh, um, research has been done by HUD. Uh, and then obviously HUD controls the research and HUD is a direct beneficiary of the proposed regulation. Okay. Yeah, um, and it's interesting to note that Dr. Nicholas Kim, a New Zealand toxicologist, has acknowledged within the report, his opinion suggested a higher level of 12.5. Um, Which was also qualified, uh, yeah. David, to say I'm comfortable with that number, but if I was going to set a standard, it would be around three. Yeah, no, I've got, I've got that there. And uh, yes, yeah, so, now I just want to labour the point for those people who don't know, the Gluckman report the recommendations that came out was that contamination up to 15 micrograms, and then after that it's contaminated and uh, uninhabitable. Any room over 15 will be remediated down to the New Zealand standard of 1.5. And if a property or had rooms of 30 or over, then it's deemed that it's probably been um, through meth uh, manufacture. Um, and in that case, it would have to hold every room in the house would need to come down to 1.5. Um, yeah, so that's that's what he came up with. So that was quite clear um, on that. Now, the reason I want to pay the point of that is that I was personally in a tribunal case in, uh, in Waitakere, and it seemed to be that the adjudicator was actually operating on different rules. And in that case, we had an ingoing meth test was completed to show that there was no meth residue in the property. Uh, at the end of the tenancy, another test was done to show that there were rooms from or samples from 55.55, sorry, of a microgram up to 37. And uh, the remediation of the owner was around about 80,000, of which the insurance paid 30,000. Now, it's interesting that the adjudicator ruled that the levels of meth contamination were above 15 micrograms, which is fine. The ruling was that three areas over 15 only needed to be decontaminated and that the insurance payout would have compensated for that. So the adjudicator dismissed the claims, even though that the tenant has clearly uh, contaminated the property with an illegal substance. Um, the adjudicator quoted the Gluckman report, as a lot of them do, um, but they seem to be adhering to another policy or advice from somewhere else. I requested under the Official Information Act where they're getting or what advice they're getting. And three days ago, I got a response to say it's going to be published on the website, but I still haven't seen it. Uh, and that's been months. Um, just to let you know that on the 3rd of October, with the help of these two gentlemen, we had a rehearing uh, because we claimed that there was a miscarriage of justice as the adjudicator had failed to appropriately apply the recommendation of the Gluckman report, which said that if any property had any rooms over 30 micrograms, the whole property need to be contaminated down to the 1.5. And there was an award made there. So again, it's a lot of effort and a lot of hours went into that to get a result. Uh, but it was just interesting that there seemed to be um, a policy that the adjudicators were operating on. And they quote Gluckman, but they seem to be operating on other rules. Um, and it's just frustrating as an industry that we have very difficult to actually get to talk to the um, head tenancy uh, adjudicator. Um, she's not, she's very hard to get hold of. So now we get into the regulatory proposals. So I think that background is important. Now, the ESR report, I've got three questions for these gentlemen. The first one is, and I think uh, Miles has already alluded to it, what changed from the 2016 ESR report for the Ministry of Health and the 2020 ESR report for the Minister of Housing? So you might want to go first on that again, Miles. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that the conversations Gavin and I have had with HUD is this, uh, and and through that ESR is there's been a change of focus, uh, and and I think you only actually have to look at who commissioned the reports to get a sense of what that change of focus is. Mm -hmm. So one was a report done for the Ministry of Health, uh, the other was a report done for the Ministry of Housing. Right. I think it's it's also interesting, Miles, that the same people did both reports. So in the uh, conference calls that had had, I specifically asked the scientists from ESR, 
you know, in 2016, 17, how can you write a report uh, which is actually backing 1.5 and a couple of years later, you're writing a report which backs 15? And he simply said, we just had a change of focus, which I think sums it up. Yeah. And, and look, I think it's part of it is, is strategy around um, persuading people that, again, you to a point there, how can uh, ESR report be scientific evidence? It's scientific advice, uh, not evidence, David, because uh, all essentially we've got is a, is a review um, of the, uh, um, uh, the, the available information. And the thing that has changed uh, is that um, the definition under Gluckman of evidence was um, peer-reviewed uh, papers published in scientific or medical uh, journals. And uh, there's work done out of Australia, which included examples out of um, New Zealand of people who had been in uh, properties contaminated with methamphetamine, typically at levels well below Gluckman numbers, uh, that had indicated that there appeared to be a relationship. And again, the, the output of that research was more research needs to be done, which is exactly what Gluckman said. Um, ESR took a look at that as part of their review uh, and said, yes, look, it is suggestive of a, of a causal relationship, um, but then went on to consider the cost of decontamination and the impact, the negative impact on moving somebody out of a property uh, as mitigating factors as to why uh, well, we're okay now with a, a level of, of 15. They didn't include as mitigating factors the impact of meth use on the individual using or the impact of meth use on the people who are within that property. So um, essentially what we appear to have is another report that sort of supports the proposition uh, as opposed to really being a, a, a wide ranging report that balances up the considerations in there. My view is that the, the output of that 2020 report should have been we need to do the research, the real world research, and it hasn't happened. Yeah, exactly. And, and that lapse in time, David, is a problem. I mean, they're actually, formulating regulations based on 2017-18 opinions, scientific opinions, with nothing done since then, although they've had ample opportunity. To us, that's one of the, the biggest flaws in the regulation. It's leading to illogical assumptions and old incorrect info is being used to actually write the regulation. Yep. So, so for your members, for example, David, um, it being incredibly busy in the last few years implementing uh, healthy homes um, uh, standards, right? Um, and why are they doing that? Uh, they're doing that because the scientists say cold, damp, mouldy homes definitely affect people's health and well-being. Uh, government spends over $2 million a year on research into cold, damp, mouldy homes um, to support the the, the work that's been done and I don't have any issues as far as that side of things is concerned um, however the the rationale behind not doing the research as far as methamphetamine is concerned where the scientists say there will be no impact on people's health and well-being uh, uh, is that oh look it's too hard to do the absence of the evidence one way or the other um, allows government to sustain a policy based on opinions uh, and the fundamental problem that I have and some of your members may have experienced is this, is that I've engaged with people in the property management sector uh, who go into a property and experience an adverse physiological response on entering that property, which the opinions say can't happen. Uh, and to me, unless you can really answer that question as to how it is that those things occur and you have know, subsequent to entering, get the meth test done, oh, look, there's methamphetamine in there. Uh, unless you answer that question, you're creating a regulation that's got profound uh, uh, consequences um, for people, um, particularly in terms of how that regulation evolves. Yes, you yeah, know, it's um, ag again, it's something uh, under the health and safety. If you've got a tenant who actually complains of ill health or something, we can't just dismiss it. And maybe um, if, if people aren't testing for meth at the start of the tenancy, then they actually should actually take that as a, <laughs> as a sign that they maybe they should test it yeah. to make sure that the um, meth is not a, a cause for all these respiratory problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned health and safety there as an example, and this is how ridiculous the situation that's been created by policy is. So WorkSafe specifically refers to the New Zealand standards. So us as PCBUs, our obligations are to work to the levels recommended in the New Zealand standard. So we're dealing with a property owner at the moment 
where the results of testing are definitely over uh, the New Zealand standard, but are also definitely under the Gluckman number. So for workers going into that house, they have to wear appropriate personal protective equipment. And the owner of that property has got no recourse to insurance because they're uh, in with Vero and Vero have set the level at, uh, at 15. Um, but the tenant can carry on living in there. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, we'll, we'll move on to the, um, yeah. you've answered all three questions there. Oops, now my, come on. Hmm. All right, so we're getting into the first proposal. And this is that the um, that what what should the maximum acceptable level of meth methamphetamine residue be? And HUD's preferred option is that there be a single maximum acceptable level of fifteen micrograms. So we have we have talked about that, but again, it's just right. It's yeah. um, how much time it's, do you on it really? It's it's a very difficult question to ask, and you know my view and my experience. What you're doing is asking what percentage of the rental population of the people tenanting rentals do we want to cover? At 1.5, nobody knows how many are covered, but let's say it's 90%. Okay. At 15, it might only be 30%. So are you uh, are we comfortable with that? And so that's the difficulty with setting a minimum acceptable or a maximum acceptable level because it affects different people in different ways. So what you're trying to do is draw a line in the sand, a justifiable line in the sand. And I can tell you that from our point of view, I'm much more comfortable with 1.5 and covering 90% of the people and taking it from there rather than some other arbitrary number where you really don't know how many people you're covering. Because you've got to remember that a lot of people in social housing that I, I uh, talk to and, and deal with, they're stuck. You know, you might have been on the, on the waiting list for a, a rental from social housing from the government for a year. You get put into it. You're not told whether it's got high meth levels or, or not because it hasn't been tested for the last four years. You get put in there and you are stuck. You can't get out. You know, you, very difficult to go anywhere else. You've been waiting, um, possibly living in a car or a caravan or something or in somebody's garage for, for that amount of time and you're just happy to get in there, but it's going to make you sick. And that's, that's an issue. Yeah, the biggest, biggest problem I've had is that people would deliberately, when it comes to health, is conservative. But again, I can't see any research or there's been no research on uh, those with pre-existing medical conditions, um, asthma, et cetera, Babies and the elderly, and uh, to, they're the ones that are, you know that are. It's really quite concerning. Um, all right. Yeah, I, th I think it just uh, again on that number, you know, the whole premise behind Glutman's report was that no other jurisdiction anywhere else in the world uh, looks at meth contamination arising from use alone. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the same way as they look at meth contamination from manufacture. Uh, it, it, that was a statement made in 2018. It was wrong then. It remains wrong today. When you look at the justification for HUD, ESR did another review in 2022 of jurisdictions where this happens. Um, and whilst they noted, for example, in Colorado, they've got a guideline around meth labs. Colorado applies that to meth use. They've shut a number of libraries recently because of meth use in, in bathrooms. Uh, Oregon has a law and has had a law for uh, many, many years that sets a level of one microgram. So what we've got is an opinion that fits with um, political direction, uh, is at odds with the limited research in the, in the real world side of things and is 10 times higher than any other jurisdiction anywhere else in the world. So, so will HUD uh, push through 15? I'm almost certain that they would. Um, and I think then from a member's perspective, well, what's the, what do you want to do there? So if, um, if the law itself allows for people who wish to, so landlords and tenants who wish to contract to the level in the New Zealand standard, because there is this uncertainty, uh, then that is a, a solution to that problem, um, which from a deterrent basis, as far as the behavior is concerned, which is a large part of what you're trying to achieve with between tenancy screening, it's not uh, assurances or not just assurances around um, uh, the, the health and safety status of the property itself. It's about ensuring that you don't get the people moving into those properties uh, who have got a meth habit. What this law will do is empower those people again 
uh, and the ability to deflect them and push them off to somebody else who's not actively managing the risk is going to be diminished. So the risk for everybody is going to go up. All right. So, so, so for, for with our, um, those on the webinar who are going to look at um, making a submission, um, what would be the answer be? I, I, would it be just simply to say that um, it should be the maximum acceptable level should be the New Zealand standard mm -hmm. or any New Zealand standard that's reviewed um, by um, those who are not politically, have got a political agenda, I suppose. Independent is the word, yeah. isn't it? Independent it's, it's, so do the research, do the real world research that gives everybody confidence around what the number should be and then make it that number. Um, but if you're going to push through 15 because you want to create a situation where uh, there's no liability for, for example, social housing um, providers, uh, but you've got people who want to contract to a lower level, ensure that within the law itself, they can contract to a lower level. If you've got a landlord that doesn't want a lot of meth in their houses and a tenant that wants to move into a house that doesn't have a lot of meth in, because as it currently stands with 15 as the acceptable level, um, you, you can have tenants being moved into properties where it sits there at 14 micrograms uh, and the landlord doesn't have to do anything. They can be moved into a property where it's 25 micrograms uh, and they have to clean down to just under 15 and the tenant cannot get out of that contract. Mm. And that's the next proposal that the uh, level does, does a contaminated property need to be remediated back to and that's 15. But that's, this one irks me personally the most. <laughs> Because you're trying to keep meth out of a house to protect the owner, um, and you know who wants their house con permanently contaminated with meth. Mm -hmm. But it seems to be that they're actually setting up the stage where insurance companies and that are only allowing, as long as it's been proven that it's gone back to under 15, then meth can stay there permanently, and that really gets me uh, going. So I'll try to stay out of this one. But again, <laughs> have you got anything more, um, Gavin, that you'd like to add on that issue? Uh, not, not really, um, except that the ridiculous thing is uh, if you've got a house that's, you know, got rooms with 20 micrograms, you, you decontaminate it back down to 14, you allow the behaviour to carry on, pretty soon it'll be over 15 again, don't worry about that. Um, so it's, it is nonsense, what you should be doing is um, remediating it back, as you say, David, to low levels and trying to get rid of the meth entirely if that's possible or to the lowest level possible mm. okay the next proposal was that th this is that they should bring in a maximum inhabitable level of method methamphetamine oh god i've got caught already of meth residue and they're suggesting that a level of 30 micrograms is proposed if the premises test above this then it can be the tenancy can be terminated but unless the contaminated has been caused by the party's breach of the tenancy agreement, well, just to simply say that if it's over 30 and you've actually done an ingoing test, you can take the tenant to the tribunal um, but and to get it remediated. But if you don't, and most people, most uh, property owners or landlords, uh, real estate property managers don't test, so they've got no way of proving it's the tenant. So that means that the tenant, even though they may have caused the damage, if, if I'm reading this right, can actually stay into, if as long as it's not over 30 micrograms, they can stay in the house while it's decontaminated down to below 15. And my head just spins when I think about the, the practicalities of that and how HUD can even suggest this is a preferred option. It's, it's crazy. I mean, I, when I read this, I couldn't figure it out. And one of the reasons I said before that we think the regulation's flawed and illogical, and this is a prime case, an example, I mean, is actually the minimum acceptable level then 30, not 15, because you're allowing people to stay in the tenancy until it gets over 30. You can't get them out. I mean... <laughs> And in here also, what you've got is look in certain circumstances, and those circumstances haven't been defined. Mm -hmm. um, and and again, that 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 lack of clarity is is typical of what's going on within uh, HUD. So, for example, around some of the decontamination strategies, 
that they're sort of proposing something that they don't actually know is workable. They don't have the evidence to back it up. So a good example would be carpets being you know, vacuumed and cleaned. Mm -hmm. uh, or we'll get the research after the, uh, the fact. So, so again, what we seem to have is a problem that has been defined not as uh, how do we reduce meth contamination in houses? The problem is, um, you know, how do we reduce uh, meth testing and decontamination? Well, if you don't have the behavior, you don't have the need for the testing and the decontamination um, uh, side of things. Uh, so, you know, in here, the ability of, of property owners to get rid of people who are actively engaged in illegal activity or activity which for the time being is unlawful. Once it becomes decriminalized, it's no longer unlawful. And therefore that opportunity will, uh, will get out of the, uh, the window to mitigate uh, risk exposure. Um, it, 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 this should be seen for what it is, uh, essentially a law which is designed to enable uh, and sustain tenancies um, at the expense of um, private landlords. If social housing groups and the government wish to you know, sustain tenancies of, uh, of people with drug use um, habits, um, I, I see that as being a good thing, uh, as long as it is supported with um, engagement to uh, encourage behaviour change. But to then put that responsibility back onto um, private landlords as a uh, as an imposition on their property rights that I find really quite challenging. Yeah, I, I certainly um, I, I struggle. That they actually give an opinion. That they think that fifteen micrograms will have no adverse effects, but then they actually it's okay for tenants to stay in a house up to thirty. So yeah. again, it's that's really quite strange. So again, if you, I would actually think if it's going to, if they make it 15, why don't they actually make it like it when it was 1.5? That that's that's also the maximum inhabitable level, but that they're actually just making this heg of a lot more difficult. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons around the clean down level, for example, David, uh, where Gluckman talked about getting it down to 1.5 and then HUD saying 15, the rationale behind that is there wasn't really precedent elsewhere for having a lower clean down level than a lower trigger and activation level for the cleaning to take place. Um, so you then apply that rationale in this instance. So why have we got a higher inhabitable level versus an acceptable um, level? It, it doesn't make sense unless you step back and look at this in the context of uh, policy around drug use uh, in New Zealand and the policy around drug use in New Zealand is that users should not experience consequence or be incentivized to change their behavior the people who should experience consequence are those who are involved in manufacture distribution and supply the significance of the 30 microgram level is that that's the one that's been set by ESR and you referenced it in your um, uh, tenancy tribunal claim that we supported um that's the level that's been set by esr as as a level above which it, it's uh, you know essentially unfeasible that some attempt at manufacture hasn't taken place now you can argue the toss as far as that side of things is concerned but because esr have said that essentially that's the number above which you can terminate a tenancy so that's the number at which a tenant would experience consequence for the behavior um and and, and those who are just using that's okay will enable that habit and behavior to continue Mm. All right. Um, the next proposal was when do landlords need to test for methamphetamine contamination? And the HUD preferred option is when informed by police or a council that methamphetamine manufacture is likely to have occurred, or when a tenant or, or this is interesting, or when a tenant or anyone else has performed a screening test which results higher than 15. So there's two things there for me personally, just to get the uh, to, okay, I don't know, we've done some research on police notifying landlords of methamphetamine manufactured. There's very few cases that actually happen. So, um, and then secondly, if a tenant uh, does it, are they expecting tenants then if they suffer health effects to actually do the testing themselves? Yeah, where do we start on this one? Far out. Um, I know from personal experience that and talking to police, that they actually find very few meth labs. Okay, they they do actually find few houses with meth labs operating in them. Let's call it 10, 10 to fifteen percent of the meth labs. Um, so at that point, when they find one, they send the owner, Kaingora, or the landlord, a letter saying we found this in your property, which really gives you no option other than to test to see if there's been any uh, you know contamination 
from that that lab because don't forget labs also are transitory so i've actually tested houses that have had labs in them found in them and, and they've been fine so there is a, an issue there as well but basically let's take kaingora as an example we noted that minister woods answered a question in parliament that they had done 460 tests on their houses we assume from police reports um, in the 12 month period in 2021 that equates to about they've got 70 over 70 thousand uh tenancies at the moment that equates to about 0.007 of of a percent um so we know from um putting numbers together that I would say 20 plus percent conservatively, possibly 30 percent of Kaingo or houses have some sort of meth either smoked or manufactured in them. So they are missing the boat in a big way by expecting um, using the police or the council as their reason for suspicion. You know, obviously you can be suspicious if you get a report from the police that they found a meth lab in your in your property but there are lots of other ways that you can be suspicious about your tenancies mm. and just waiting for the police or the council and I, to be honest i have never heard of a council uh sending a report saying they found a meth lab ever so you can discount them if you wait for the police to do it i think the horse has bolted a long long time ago mm. Yeah, I, I, look, I think, you know, the council only get involved if the police get involved. So essentially what the message is, is that, you know, you only get involved with the council, um, get involved. I, I think there's a couple of sort of contexts to consider this, that, you know, these regulations were announced on the same day uh, that uh, there was also announcements around regulation of, of property managers. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, why are we regulating property managers? Well, we, we want them to be more professional. We want them to be more um, onto it. Regulation of real estate agents um, happened years ago. Uh, and the framework of reference that real estate agents operate under when it comes to methamphetamine contamination is, you know, what should a reasonably competent licensee be aware of? So they don't have to go looking for hidden issues. But if there's stuff that's pretty obvious, uh, then they need to be able to demonstrate that they investigate that. Uh, and having investigated it, um, then, you know, the, you roll on um, from there. So we've got an invisible contaminant that's hidden behaviour, but there are, you know, lots of hints and, and clues, as, uh, as Gavin said. So, so rather than just saying, you know, police or council, um, make it that test of what a reasonably competent property manager should, uh, should be aware of, um, put some criteria around that so property managers aren't shooting in the dark and landlords aren't shooting in the dark. Uh, and, and then you've got a test which is is more risk based, as opposed to this, which is as 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 Gavin has pointed out, is just going to be wholly inadequate. Because what sits alongside this particular requirement of the regulation uh, is something that again hasn't been really clearly uh, articulated through the uh, proposal and the information that's been released, but is part of the supplementary order paper that sits in behind this, from which the regulation has been. Um, proposed. And what that says as far as liability of, of landlords is that unless you know there's a problem, if you put a tenant into a property that's got 30 micrograms plus of methamphetamine, then the tenant can end that tenancy. If it's over 15, there's no liability uh, on that property owner as far as that side of things is concerned. Um, so you then look at that because they didn't know. Right? So how do you know you test? But if you don't test, then you don't know. And if you only have to test because the police are involved, if the police weren't involved, I didn't know anything. So I can suspend my, you know, reasonably competent, I can suspend my professionalism and essentially avoid liability. So to Gavin's point around Kaingora, which has got a whole bunch of incredibly vulnerable tenants who are part of it, a massive problem with contamination, this law essentially writes a blank check as far as liability is concerned, says, don't worry about it. Yeah, you're fine. And, and again, as, as a society, are we happy with that? Are we happy with a, a government essentially writing a law from which its direct financial benefit uh, is in the tens, hundreds of millions of dollars, the consequences of which are going to be borne by the people who end up living in those properties? Yeah, David, you, you've opened up a Pandora's box with this one, really. I mean, when you, when you talk about who's responsible for a property, for the state of the property, 
if it isn't the landlord, then who is? I, I haven't figured this out yet. Um, you know, if you look at the Residential Tenancies Act, the landlord's responsible for everything except meth contamination, yeah. which, again, to us, is illogical. Yeah. So what happens, and I've talked to many, many landlords and got the same response. Basically, oh, no, there isn't a problem here. Uh, the government says don't worry about it. Um, we're moving on. We're not doing anything uh, but we are getting property managers in to look after the property and to get the tenants in, okay? So what happens is then down the track, they find out that their house is actually contaminated, possibly badly contaminated. They're not at fault because they didn't know about it, but they're not very happy with property managers. And for me, this is a flaw. It, mm. it passes responsibility and liability down to the property managers. And that, to me, is unfair and it's not right. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, on to the next point. Proposal. What are the testing and decontamination timeframes? And they're saying it's soon as practicable. Mm. I don't know whether we want to spend much time on that. Um, I think the reality is you can't do anything better uh, than that because there's so many variables. Uh, I mean, you, you know, your members will be in different parts of the country serviced by uh different numbers and quality of uh, of service providers and sometimes it just it's just going to take a little bit longer than uh, than others mm. okay the next one is who can do the testing anyone can perform screening tests using approved kit test kits i don't know of any approved test kits do you guys know of any uh, so not uh, not at the 15 level um esr did some validation of some of those instant answer answer kits um, uh, so there are some that are um, uh, have been through the process described within the uh, the New Zealand standard, and obviously all the lab backed uh, analysis uh, is part of that side of things. But uh, yeah, you know, again, uh, what we've got to remember is okay, what was the catalyst for establishment of the New Zealand standards? The catalyst for the establishment of the New Zealand standard was that anybody could go and do a meth test, and it created chaos and uncertainty. So then we've got the New Zealand standard that created a framework of reference that lots of people could have uh, confidence in. And now what the government's saying is that that New Zealand standard, well, we'll get rid of that provision that you have to know what you're doing and anybody can have a crack at this stuff. Mm. It's a massive retrograde step. And as part of this process, what they've also talked about is approved, uh, um, not just test kits, but approaches to testing. And one of the things that they're proposing is no longer acceptable is the multi-white field composite approach to sampling. So everybody's got sort of slightly different views around this sort of thing, but the reality is that um, around 80% of properties, that lowest cost multi-white field composite approach is the best thing to do. And then there's a whole bunch of properties where if you do a lab composite approach uh, to testing, your client will end up spending a truckload of money unnecessarily because you go past a reference level uh, and the next stage is to analyze all of those samples individually. If you break those uh, 10 samples down into two groups of five, you're not going to pass your reference and threshold level so you don't incur uh, any more money. And those things have been missed uh, in this desire to essentially enshrine Gluckman thinking uh, into uh, a regulation, um, which again will do more harm. In this instance, the harm being greater economic cost. When it comes to then a tenant, and the likelihood of a tenant doing the test, you know, most tenants don't have the money to pay for this stuff anyway. So if we're going to make them pay even more money to do it, they're going to be less people doing it, which again, when you look at the supplementary order paper, uh, you know, runs right into uh, the purpose of this regulation, which is to reduce the amount of testing that is done. Mm. And, you know, from our point of view, this regulation is uh, driven in large part by reducing cost. Okay, and this is an example. Um, screening tests really are designed to show whether you've got meth in the house or not. And I know property managers that use these uh, instant test kits. And once they have found a positive, just like a rat test for COVID, they then go to the professionals and find out exactly what the the issue is, but I don't think that they should jump straight to a detailed assessment. I think we should uh, basically go and get people like ourselves to go and do screening tests to get them done properly and independently. Um, and let's face it, the cost is 
$300, you know, $400. I don't think it's a massive cost if you're doing that in a property once every one or two years. Um, have you got a plumber in lately, for instance? I tell you, I have, and it didn't cost me $300. It cost me way more, but nobody blinks, <laughs> blinks an eye about that. But if you get one of us to come and do a screening test, $300, you know, it, it, it seems to be a major hurdle and barrier. It doesn't need to be. All right. I'll, the next one is um, what is the prescribed decontamination process? And again, I don't know what how our members would would do this. Is is there anything that they need to know that's particularly bad about that preferred option from HUD? I think well, so key issues. Uh, if it's over fifteen but under thirty, tenants can remain in the property. So mm. if the tenant is the one who's responsible for the contamination. You know that could be an endless cycle of of testing and and uh, and and cleaning. Uh, two, um, leave the carpets behind uh, with no evidence that leaving the carpets behind is an appropriate thing to do. And so, what's the significance of of that? Um, from the limited work that's been done on carpet testing, it's a really significant sink uh, as far as meth contamination is concerned. So a lot of that dust that's got meth on it sinks into the carpet gets incorporated uh, and it's bloody hard um, to clean and if this is about the health and well-being you've now got the most vulnerable running around and rolling around on the carpets themselves um, where the problem potentially continues and is uh, is exacerbated uh, again what what's in the standard is pretty good um, my view as far as the standard is concerned around the decontamination process is that there's a lot of lessons that have been learned in the last five years and the standard should be updated uh, to incorporate those lessons so that people who rely on um, the, uh, the results of testing, the decontamination that works that's done, they get a much, much higher level of confidence. I think the key thing that is in here that is problematic uh, is the thought that anybody can do the decon. Um, because the problem with that is the potential for spot cleaning, people trying to fudge um, the issue, uh, not having the ability to get a certificate of clearance that people can have confidence in. And so the stigma and the issue of the meth contamination carries on and on and on for far longer than it should do. Okay. All right, cool. And who can, you, you've just covered that off of that is who can do the contamination mm. work. So let's leave that. And what are the requirements for managing abandoned goods and contaminated properties? Now, again, this, is, this has made me a little bit of giggle because at the end of the day, it's been my experience after 25 years in residential property that they say that you've, if, a, if, if a furniture is worth a certain amount, you've got to keep it stored for 35 days. I've, it's never, ever happened. The only thing that ever gets left in a property when a tenant leaves is the stuff that they don't want, and it's just rubbish. Mm -hmm. um, but again, with contaminated pro um, material, are they suggesting that there's some special way to deal with that, or is it just straight into the skip bin? Uh, they're saying that you continue should continue to to store it. Um, that's based yeah, on it's, uh, if it's up to a certain level. But again, um, I don't think the places will want to store furniture if it's contaminated with methamphetamine. So, and if it's contaminated with methamphetamine, how much value does it have? Well, it has no value, no. You wouldn't have thought issue, so. The issue I have with this actually is that I think a lot of that personal belongings end up on Trade Me or Facebook Marketplace. Oh. And so I personally would not buy any couches, soft toys, or you know, used carpet from those sources, to be honest with you, unless you're very sure of where it comes from. I, I have a couple of things I'll throw into the mix on that. I had a... Uh, a property management um, business where uh, the decision was made to take the contents of a property that had significant meth contamination over 15 and deliver it to the salvos. Yeah. And then I have uh, a situation talking with some um, farm owners in the South Island. Uh, they've had significant issues with, uh, with um, a worker with a meth habit. Uh, the, in this instance, because there was known risk of contamination and location and cost of travel and all that sort of care, and we did a lab composite approach, sampled in line with the New Zealand standard for a detailed assessment. Um, uh, two groups, seven samples in each group. The, the, the totals was 14 micrograms and 20 micrograms of methamphetamine. So mm -hmm. in one group where you're not gonna get over 
15 and one group because it's distributed it's never going to be over 15 hours i'm picking we'll see numbers between three and four micrograms when it's split out um they helped the tenant move out of the property so the goods weren't abandoned they were assisted into the trailer by the owners who got giggly uh ended up with massive headaches felt seriously out of sorts for 48 hours before they came right again yeah and levels and in property where it's going to nowhere near 15 micrograms yeah and they're not living in there permanently um all right um this is great we're getting to the end now but again i'm um said that there's no questions and and uh in the webinar so if you could please um go to the bottom there with the question and answer um or even in the chat it'd be good to actually hear your questions while you're doing that i'm just going to go back to the um the powerpoint and just to show you that the submissions close on the 5th, that's Monday. There is a online submission survey link, which is here. Um, so you go through and answer those questions. Uh, Miles, you said there's something like 30 questions in that survey? 40. 40 questions, wow. Um, so if you can just chip away at that and do that, I would mm. appreciate it. Yeah, alternatively through that link david there is an email address that you could uh, simply respond to and put in key points so rather than necessarily providing hud with all the feedback that they've requested um you know feedback on levels feedback on occupancy um you know again my view is if, if we're creating a law based on opinions rather than you know fact-based evidence uh, the risk is that once the research is done um it, it's found that those opinions were wrong and at the moment, those opinions aren't stacking up with the lived experience of people living in the real um, world. So I would suggest that the risk of that is pretty high. So for people who work to this new regulation, the risk is that they end up with, let's say, 40 micrograms of meth post-decon, they get the paintbrush out, and now they've encapsulated that. Uh, and then you're into a, uh, a situation um, where what does that owner do if the level starts to come back down again? So my view uh, is that the, the government should be committing to indemnifying owners uh, and tenants who are exposed to levels uh, that they say are okay and subsequently found not to be. And again, if you could back these numbers, there should not be a problem with you know, giving that commitment to indemnifying um, people uh, as to the outcomes of the real world research. The hope is that it's up there. It is high, and there's some other reason why those people experience those adverse health responses. Um, but again, if you're going to push through a law, you make sure that you give people a safety net uh, who follow that law. I've got a question from Roger. Um, it is my understanding that Chris Bishop National agrees with the New Zealand standard. How feasible is reversing a ludicrous regulation with the new government? Yeah, very good point. We've uh, had meetings with Chris Bishop and he seems fairly supportive, as supportive as he can be. Um, he, I think he realises that he is uh, possibly going to be the Minister of Housing, possibly at the end of the year, and could have a huge problem to, to take on. Um, so, yeah, we've encouraged him to support the standard, or if it's, if it's reviewed and more research is done, whatever um, the standard says. Um, and... Yeah, he, I think he's got his head around the issue, to be honest with you. He's been, uh, been very good to deal with. Mm, okay. So there is a chance that we could save it if, if, there's, a, if there's a change of government. Now, I thought that um, Tracy lift, raised her hand. Um, if you'd like to do it again, Tracy, if there's a question or... Oh, she has too. I'll, I'll, I'll try and test this out, Tracy. It's allow you to talk if you've got the mic off on. How's that? Oh, you've, if you just unmute yourself, Tracy, ask your question. Sorry, I was just trying to tell you that the chat was off. <laughs> ah, ah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, this is a really good sort of example of how stupid this government is. Sorry, I'm very opinionated on this. <laughs> <laughs> Rightly so, Tracy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks for that, Tracy. Okay. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, we'll call it a day. Thank you very much, everybody. It's uh, going going on to uh, 56, 50, 55 minutes, which is quite a good session.
Um, uh, and just for, for what it's worth, David, if um, you know if people do have questions, that go away from this, and they have a question, they're more than welcome to give me a ring, uh, and uh, and have a chat, and uh, yeah, so happy to share my details with members if that's uh, I'm more than happy for you to do that. Uh, again, I think that 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 what the consultation period closing, I don't believe is the end of it. I think it's the start of it, uh, and. And actually, the people who are most exposed to you know, the, that primary risk of health, safety and well-being are tenants. Uh, and I think there's a lot of tenants if, if you sort of turn around to them and say, oh, the government's proposing law that means that we can put you into a house that's 10 times higher than any other jurisdiction anywhere else in the world would allow, at least, and 30 times higher than Australia, they get a little bit grumpy. Uh, mm. about those um, sorts of things and then fundamentally when it circles back round to uh, it's been decided that the research is too hard to do even though for other covenant policy issues you can do the research um, that this is going to there should rightly be a lot of frustrated people about that yeah, and, yeah, yeah David do the research know, in, in uh, basically in summation from us we just encourage your members to submit uh, painful as it may be, um, and to make their, their views clear, I think that HUD are uh, lacking in real world evidence. <laughs> they like to hear what people's experiences are, very difficult for them to know all of that. So anything that you can tell them, um, I think they will be very happy to hear. Um, and the real world experience that we are finding is that meth contamination is a health issue whether it's caused by manufacture or by use, uh, people are affected by it. And it's something that you have to um, cope with and deal with on an ongoing basis. Don't wait until your, your property or your landlord's property is contaminated to a high level. Find out early in the piece. Doing screening tests, et cetera, are really more like uh, a, a, small, a small costless in, insurance policy, and you should be doing it. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's probably all we need to say, but definitely submit. With, with one addition, Gavin, right? And that is that the problem is getting worse. Oh yeah. Uh, and, uh, and where's the evidence for, for that? Uh, so we as an organization, uh, David mentioned we're going for a wee while now, uh, in the year before um, Glutman, with the detailed testing work that we were doing, uh, one in four of the properties that we were doing detailed testing work, bearing in mind the New Zealand stand was our framework of reference at that point, had at least one sample over 15. Now that has increased to two out of every three properties uh, that we do detailed testing on. Uh, and the, uh, the effective uh, level of detailed testing that we're doing relative to screening assessments is four times higher than it was. Mm. So, so, so the problem is getting bigger. And simply because people choose to turn a blind eye, doesn't make the problem go away. It simply allows it to fester and for it to become worse. What this regulation will do if it goes through unchecked is, is do more of that. Right? So why did it change? It changed because Gluckman and the government sent out the signal that there's no problems with meth in houses. Uh, the people who had been taking their habits outside came back into uh, the property themselves. They were imbued with a high level of self-confidence. Uh, we've had COVID chucked into the mix and the meth problem itself has become worse. This regulation goes through, uh, that signal will be reinforced. Um, you know, landlords will be uh, significantly reduced in terms of the power and the relationship um, that they, uh, they have. Uh, so habits will be enabled. The only people, frankly, who are going to benefit out of this regulation are the people who manufacture and supply methamphetamine. Everybody else is going to experience the cost. There'll be a, a lag in the system, uh, but sure as apples, um, there'll be more and more people at levels over 15. There'll be more and more people at levels over 30. It's just a matter of time. Is that what we want? And then they'll have to make the acceptable level 30, then it'll be 50, and then it'll be 100. <laughs> and so sooner or later, we've got to address this issue. I've, I've got to add, uh, as the association, we're also happy if people have questions or um, need any sort of assistance for, for them to give us a ring as well. David, if you post our, our uh, contact numbers. Sure. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for the time. And uh, I'm hoping that the members have actually had uh, more knowledgeable out of this and really encourage them to make a submission. Um, yeah, it's we'll be doing everything we can. Educate your owners, educate your tenants, because uh, 
I think that's the groundswell is going to be the biggest thing to actually changing people's attitudes mm. about this. Mm. Uh, trying to expose the truth because at the moment, um, I'm just sick and tired of people saying, when I spoke to um, the, the president of the Renters Association, I thought that everything was sweet and I had to bring it to their attention that there's actually more to this than just 15's okay, let's just move on. Um, mm. But certainly the government up until now has been very good at getting that message across. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you for all those to participate. I'll send out the link of this recording, um, pass it around and educate as many people as you can. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks. Thank Cheerio. you. Bye-bye.